to this lunchtime <laughs> lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce one of UCT's upcoming scientists, Falili Mbata, who hails from, oh, was, grew up in Umlauzi um, Township near Durban. She was announced last year as one of UCT's five NGAP academics, and NGAP stands for New Generation of Academics Program. Also last year, she spent two months at Northumbria University and the University of Durham as a Newton Fund researcher and guest lecturer. Falili is a PhD candidate and an assistant lecturer in the Department of Environmental and Geographical Science. Her research interests lie in the field of marine and coastal governance, and she has worked with poor and marginalized communities aiming to help those whose lives have not been extensively studied so far and who rely on the coast for their livelihood. Thank you so much, Felili. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining me this afternoon. It's, it's a pleasure for me to be here. So as been introduced, uh, my research uh, explores a lot of issues around plural governance systems especially those that affect rural livelihood strategies in rural areas in South Africa. And so what has come out, come out a lot in, from my research uh, using the, the Cosi Baker study as a lens is the fact that livelihoods have not really been studied uh, a lot in rural coastal contexts in South Africa. And more so, it's not clear how governance interventions that have taken place over time uh, have actually influenced people's livelihood strategies in, in many parts of South Africa. So I will begin uh, the lecture with highlighting some of the key concepts and some of the key ideas that I will talk about in this research so that you can have an, an understanding of what I mean when I'm talking about governance and when I'm talking about livelihoods. Okay. So why am I interested on the coast? And why is the coast a very useful lens to understand issues around governance as well as issues around livelihoods? Well, coastal resources in most parts of the world, especially in Southern Africa, they are very important for the livelihoods of people that reside in these areas, especially indigenous communities whose livelihoods have, have not really well been studied in, in using the governance lens. So coastal uh, areas also underpin profitability for many sectors that operate along the coast, such as fisheries, whether you're looking at small scale fisheries or industrial fisheries, mining, uh, forestry, tourism, a lot of that is happening in Southern Africa, especially in the, in the South African context. So in, for example, we have a lot of contestations happening around mining in the coast. In KwaZulu-Natal with Richards Bay Minerals, in the Eastern Cape with the Kolobeni Mines, and also in the Western Cape more recently. So there are a lot of issues there. But uh, unfortunately in this lecture I won't be going into that. However, although the coast underpins profitability for many sectors that operate along the coast, there's still a, a problem in South Africa where we still have the history that we have, where a lot of people that reside on the coast were marginalized from being able to access physically and to be able to bene uh, benefit from coastal resources up until 1994. So in 1998, we had our very first uh, Marine Living Resources Act and then other environmental acts that came during the time and after that, they sought to provide redress and to restore the rights of previously marginalized peoples from accessing the coast. But even in 2017, in this present day, a lot of the communities that reside in coastal environments in South Africa are still marginalized. A lot of the ideals that are contained in our constitution about human rights are still not the lived experiences of people that live in rural areas along the coast, and we'll see some of that. And as a result of this, there are growing levels of inequality when it comes to the use, the access, and the management of coastal resources. So I'll be touching a lot on that as well. And what can we do in order to bridge some of these gaps and in order to improve governance? Because a lot of these issues, to some people, they may just seem like social issues or economic issues or political issues, but they actually have a negative impact on the sustainability of the resources themselves. So we need to understand these issues and unpack them and see how can we address them in order to move towards more innovative ways of governing coastal resources. Okay. 
So some of the key concepts that I'll be looking at today include livelihoods, access and use, management versus governance. So, so some people don't understand the difference between management and governance, so I'll be touching on that. Legal pluralism, statutory versus traditional or customary institutions, power and politics, distributive and procedural justice, as well as benefit sharing. I know it all sounds like a mouthful right now, but I will be going through all these concepts so you'll have a better understanding of how they relate to this issue at, by the end of this lecture. Okay, so, so why do we care about rural environments? Because a lot of the research that I do is on the coast but in rural contexts. Well, we do care about this because most of sub-Saharan Africa, including Asia, is still very rural. For example, approximately 60% of Africa is rural, and in South Africa, approximately 35% of our landscape is rural. So it's still a large part of South Africa, and very little is known about what is happening in these areas in terms of livelihoods, in terms of uh, natural resource availability, and in terms of how these resources are governed. And also, there's a lot of urbanization that's been taking place for many years, so there, there's been a constant decline in terms of rural populations in South Africa. But the interesting thing about Kosi Bay is that a lot of the people that reside there have no intentions of leaving. So although many people believe that people in rural areas will eventually leave and go to urban areas to look for opportunities, a lot of people in Kosi Bay are not interested in, in leaving the area because they feel attached to the natural environment around them and they see themselves as one with the environment. So, so, so they actually identify themselves with the natural environments, which is why it's difficult for them to leave. So I'll be talking also a little bit about that uh, later on. So in case you were wondering, what do we mean by livelihoods? Because it's such a very, it can be a very loose word. So I'm just gonna draw on the literature to try and help us understand what is meant by livelihoods. So livelihoods thinking basically evolved a lot around the 1980s after the 19, the 1980s after the Brantland uh, Commission report, and uh, Robert Chambers, who was one of the pioneers of uh, sustainable livelihoods thinking, came up with this definition in 1995 where he defined livelihoods as a means of gaining a living. And this definition has been used a lot, and Robert Chambers has been very influential to many people who have sought to study the livelihoods of people in rural areas. There's also another guy, Ian Schoons, who came uh, later on to, to try and, and unpack this concept of sustainable livelihoods. So we have livelihoods, but then we also have sustainable livelihoods. So he defined a livelihood as one that comprises capabilities, assets, and activities for a means of living. And he's, he stated that a livelihood is sustainable when it can cope with and recover from stresses and shocks, maintain or enhance its capabilities and assets, while not undermining the natural resource base. So you can see that the, when, when we talk about sustainable livelihoods, we allude to uh, concepts such as stresses and shocks, as well as enhancing cap capabilities and assets, and it also involves the natural resource base. So there's this conception that people in poor areas, because they are poor, they are just out to to, to have as much resource, natural resources that they can find. But actually a lot of research, including mine, is proving that actually this is not the case. People in rural areas do understand conservation, even in a customary sense, and in a sense that is very, is not similar to Western ways of thinking about conservation. They do care about nature, and they do have customary ways of conserving these resources, which I'll be talking about. So, so this is the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework. I'm not gonna go into depth with it because it might bore you, but this framework has been developed uh, by scholars including Ian Schoons, and it's been widely used in livelihoods uh, uh, literature and in livelihoods projects and so on uh, globally, actually. So the most important thing that this framework is trying to say is that people in marginalized areas, especially in rural areas, they combine, oops, is, is there a pointer? Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's okay. So, the mouse, I think. oh, the mask, perfect. So people combine a, a suite of uh, 
capitals, that's what it's called here, such as natural capital, financial capital, human capital, social capital. In, so these are livelihood resources. So people combine these in order to formulate livelihood strategies and produce livelihood outcomes. That's the key thing that you need to understand here. And what it all is also stated here is that institutions or organizations or governance actors, if you will, they mediate the way in which people are able to combine these resources to, pro to formulate livelihood strategies and produce livelihood outcomes. But what is coming out of my research is that in, in this framework, institutions and organizations are just the small box here. But what I'm arguing is that actually this box here is, is basically influences how this whole process works. It should be much bigger than this. And I will talk about that a little bit later on. So this is just highlighting some of uh, the key components of the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework. Okay, so now I'm just gonna move quickly to governance. So governance is a, is a concept that has come up a lot also in the past 20 to 30 years as there's been a realization that when it comes to managing coastal resources and other types of natural resources which are very complex and very diverse, governments cannot be fully able to manage all aspects of environments. It's impossible. They've tried for many years but more and more, there was a realization in globally that actually governments cannot fully manage resources by themselves. So this is why other actors started becoming involved in the governance of uh, uh, resources, especially when you look at areas like the coast, where you have mining sectors, you have the forestry, you have fisheries, you have communities. Those are a lot of different actors. And each and every actor has their own interests and their own perceptions about what conservation is and what it should look like. So sometimes getting those actors together and trying to reconcile their interests and ideas can be very difficult. And that's why, for example, coastal governance has been termed a wicked problem. It's very wicked because it's very difficult to try and come up with one way that everyone agrees with of governing uh, coastal resources. So that's why there's been a shift away from a focus on government to governance in natural resource management sectors globally, including in South Africa. So in the literature, there are many definitions of governance. It's a very broad concept, and it's, sometimes it's used very loosely. But for the purposes of this talk, I've, I've extracted two definitions uh, of governance. I'm not really gonna go deeply into them, but the easiest one is the one here in the bottom, which says uh, governance uh, involves the quality of the totality of interactions between two systems, the system to be governed and the governing system. So you have those who govern and the system that's being governed. And the, govern, the, 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 the system to be governed comprises many different components, such as the social components, economic, political, ecological, and so on. So when we talk about governance, we also talk a lot about institutions. So institutions are basically there to control access to and benefit from natural resources. So there are systems for enforcing established rules and norms about managing resources, and they also uh, include policies, principles, regulations, rules, and arrangements uh, which form part of institutional mechanisms or arrangements to manage resources. And usually rules are very critical for managing resources and, and show, ensuring long-term sustainability. So what I've tried to do here is just give you a very broad overview of some of the concepts so that when I mention them later on, you'll have an idea of what they mean. Okay, now I'm going to the interesting part, Kosi Bay. So, so globally, there are a lot of debates about reconciling conservation with development, and in particular, rural development. Because for many years, for many people around the world, especially in developing country, conservation has meant the dispossession and the marginalization of many indigenous peoples uh, for, for in the name of conserving resources, which, which is a good, uh, it's a good act, but at the same time, 
For many people, it has meant that they've lost access to uh, land or resources that they've previously used to support their livelihoods. So over the past 20 years, a lot of scholars have started uh, thinking about how, how do we make conservation work for resource sustainability, but at the same time to promote development in areas where people were previously marginalized by conservation, including in the South African context. So these debates are ongoing and and South Africa is, is struggling, not just South Africa, many countries in, in Africa are struggling with trying to find the balance between conservation and rural development. So, so like I've said previously, various people residing in rural areas have a long history of using natural resources to support their livelihoods that predates the, the colonial era. And also agriculture has, is considered a very important livelihood strategy for many people that live in coastal areas, in rural coastal areas in South Africa. But then there are many factors that have come in over the years to, 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 that have affected the livelihood of agriculture, but I'm not gonna go into depth uh, explaining each and every one of them at this point. So South Africa is one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. This uh, is taken from chapter two of the Bill of Rights, uh, sections 24 and 25, which basically highlights that everyone in South Africa has the right to, to have an environment protected for the benefits of present and future generations through reasonable legislative and other measures. So that's here. And then also it goes on to say under section 25 down there, that the public interest includes the nation's commitment to land reform, to reforms to bring about equitable access to all South Africa's natural resources. So the rights to, 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 to equitable access, to, the rights of equitable access to natural resources is, is a constitutional right for all South Africans. But unfortunately, this is not the lived experience of many people that reside on the coast, including in areas such as Kosi Bay. And part of the reason why this is the case is that in South Africa, we have this huge uh, problem where we're struggling with uh, the gap between policy and practice. We have very progressive laws that promote human rights, that promote equality and equity, but we, we lack when it comes to the implementation of those laws and in setting up institutional arrangements to ensure that all the principles that are enshrined within our laws and our policies are, are reflected to, in, the, in the realities of the people on the ground. So this is a big problem in South Africa. And like I've said, there's a mismatch between ground realities and policy regimes, and this causes a lot of uh, friction and conflict at the local level. It also hinders on equity, resource sustainability, as well as sustainable livelihood outcomes. So what I've tried to do in my research is I've used life, the livelihoods lens as a tool to understand social, economic, and political implications of governance, especially uh, in the conservation sector. So the reason why I've, I've used the livelihoods lens is because the livelihood lens is really critical in, in terms of helping us understand uh, e e questions about equality and equity. Because the, the, the concepts equality and equity are, are usually used synonymously, but they actually mean two very different things when we're talking about uh, justice. So for instance, I found this image in social media and I felt that it best explains the difference between equality and equity. Because most of the time, we tend to talk about equality, which is a good thing. But sometimes when we focus on equality, we miss that sometimes certain people need more help than others because of uh, various reasons that have probably have to do with history or the present, et cetera. But when we think more about equity, then we try to find ways to assist different people while we understand the context, because context is really important. While certain laws and principles and certain conventions that we adopt as South Africa may be very useful, sometimes when we don't translate them appropriately to our context, they might end up being problematic because we didn't try to address them according to our context. So this is something that comes out a lot in my research that I will talk about as well. 
So my research has been largely focused in Kosi Bay. So for those of you who are not familiar with the area, so this is the map of Africa, so it's South Africa. So Kosi Bay is located on the northernmost coast of KwaZulu-Natal. I don't know if you can see there, I'm trying to move the mouse. So it's right on the border between South Africa and Mozambique on the east coast. And Kosi Bay it forms part of South Africa's very first World Heritage Site, known as Ismangaliso World Heritage Site. Some of you may know it's a St. Lucia, but the name changed in 2004. And it's protected as a natural World Heritage Site. So according to the United Nations, uh, well, UNESCO, uh, there are three types of World Heritage Sites. So there are natural sites, there are uh, cultural sites, as well as mixed sites. So a site can be both natural and cultural, but this particular one is a natural site. And it has one of the most unique ecosystems that you can find anywhere in the world. So it consists of this very unique uh, estuary and lake system. So this is the Kosi estuary, which adjoins to four lakes. So these first three lakes are, okay, these first two lakes are salt water lakes. And this huge one here, the big lake, or, so this is lake one, lake two, lake three. It, this lake has a mixture of uh, salt water and fresh water, and then that one is, is mostly fresh water. So it's a really unique system, and it's very rich in biodiversity, very rich in, 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 in plants and animal species. So it's, it's, it's a very dynamic system. So these are some of the pictures taken from Kosi Bay. So that's the picture of the, est of the estuary. And there's a very unique type of fishery that exists in this area. It's, that that is, 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 uh, is, is a, is a small-scale fishing practice of the local people. So what is the, the system is called? It's called a trap fishing system. So what you see here in, the, as, in these lines are the fish traps. So this is a very unique type of, uh, fish, uh, of a fishery because each of these traps that you see along these lines belong to a certain family in the community. So these has, have been passed down from generation to generation within the families. And they, you can see that there's a, a virus of them uh, within the lakes. So the idea be, be behind the fish trap is that the, the, the fish can enter the trap, but they can't leave the trap. So every day, the fishermen will go and check in the evening whether any fish were caught inside the trap. So, so according to UNESCO, this area has been protected as a World Heritage Site because of its outstanding universal value. There's also a population of approximately 141,000 people in the area. It's 98% rural and only 32% of the population is economically active. And like I mentioned earlier, it has five different ecosystems. So these include June forests, grasslands, tidal zones, coral reefs, as well as sandy beaches and the four lakes. And this system has been important for livelihoods for, for many uh, centuries and decades. So this is one of the fishermen from the area who, who was showing me how to construct a fish trap. So they harvest a lot of the material around the lakes, and this is what the finished product looks like up close. So, so this area, it's a World Heritage Site, as I've mentioned, but there are many different layers of governance that are present here. So it's a World Heritage Site, but at the same time, it's adjacent to a marine protected area, a coastal forest reserve, as well as a transfrontier conservation area. So there are different layers of protection from the international level to the regional level to the national level to the local level. So you can imagine it's, 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 it's high levels of conservation that you find here. And so, so don't, 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 don't mind the, the fancy terms that I have here, but that's just basically the description of how the governance picture looks like here. So, so this, this uh, diagram is basically trying to show the different levels of protection that exist in the area. So from the international level all the way down to the local level. So you also find different types of institutions that are present here. You have statutory institutions. So these are institutions tied to the state. And then you have traditional and customary institutions, which I will speak about later on. And all these 
are, have, are comprised of different institutional arrangements which draw on different sources of law to manage this whole system. So there are different webs of, of legislation that different actors uh, draw on in order to perform their roles here. So as a result of that, we, we end up with this uh, uh, situation of legal pluralism. So legal pluralism refers to the coexistence of multiple and multi-level legal orders within an area. So as we've seen in that diagram, there are multiple uh, legal orders that are present within this area, all trying to manage one system. So this is just a quote from the literature that elaborates on what legal pluralism is. I'm just going to read the first two sentences. Uh, so legal pluralism refers to the multiple and coordinated coexisting and overlapping bodies of law, but that there is diversity amongst them. They may make competing claims of authority, they may impose conflicting demands or norms, and they may have different styles and orientations. So you kind of get the, the feel of what we mean by legal pluralism and what could be the result of that, but I will speak about that later on. Okay. So just going back to this, so earlier on I tried to explain to you what theoretically, from a theoretical point of view, what I'm trying to do by using the Kosi Baker study. What I'm trying to do by using the Kosi Baker study is to highlight governance within livelihoods uh, debates. So in my research, what I'm trying to argue is that governance, especially the components of history, politics, and power, has a huge role in determining what resource sustainability will look like at the end of the day, and what people can or cannot do in terms of livelihood strategies. Because a lot of livelihood scholars speak about livelihoods as if someone can just wake up in, like a lot of us in the cities, we actually have the privilege. You can just wake up and decide, okay, today I'm, gonna, I'm going to climb Table Mountain. Or oh, today I'm just going to go to this restaurant. But people in these areas don't have those kind of options. They can't just wake up and say, oh, today I'm just going to check out the fish in that lake. Oh, today I'm just going to go to the coast and have a swim. The reality is people can't just make those choices. There are a lot of regulations that regulate what they can or cannot do. So within this context, governance plays a huge role in driving what livelihood strategies are. And the other important thing about governance is that history plays a huge role in terms of determining what governance looks like now. Because for us to understand why things, they are, not, that, why things are the way they are now, we need to look back in history. What historical events have resulted into what we see now? For example, in Kosi Bay, a lot of the governance arrangements and structures that exist now are a product of historical governance arrangements that have taken place or that have op uh, uh, been introduced in this area over the period of time. And I will speak about that later on. So there are also issues of politics and power, especially among institutions that inv are involved in governance that actually at the end of the day affect local people on the ground. And I will talk about that later on. Okay. So, this slide is just basically touching on some of the methods that I use. So for my research, I use a lot of grounded uh, research where I spend a lot of time living within these areas so that I can get a full understanding of what's going on from all different angles. And the, another passion that I've had is actually to document some of the perspective of the local people from their own mouths. Because a lot of the time when we talk about resource sustainability and governance of natural resources, a lot of work that has been done has not really spent enough time tapping into the indigenous knowledge of the local people. Because what I do in my research is I do trans transdisciplinary research that not only just looks at the ecological side of things or the environmental side of things, I engage also with the social, the political, and I try and relate all of that in order to have a very well-rounded and holistic understanding of what governance is. And so as a result of that, I, I spent a lot of time living in the area, engaging with different people, including the people from the communities, including people from 
uh, the World Heritage Sites Authorities, Isimangaliso uh, Authority, Ezemvelo, KZN Wildlife, which are the conservation authorities in KwaZulu Natal, some uh, traditional authorities, gov government actors, and so on. So I used a suite of qualitative and quantitative methods in order to perform this, but that, that wouldn't be very interesting to you. Okay. So in this slide, I have a timeline. So, so, so this timeline basically depicts some of the key governance events that have taken place since 1948 that have had a direct influence on the livelihood strategies of the people in Kosi Bay. So I, I chose 1948 because while one of the methodologies that I used in my research was oral history interviews. So I tried to find some of the oldest people in the area and to document, because within these rural areas, especially in KwaZulu Natal, a lot of the history in, of the area is not written down. It's carried down in the memories of the people from generation and passed down from generation to generation. So I tried to collect those stories and triangulate them with what is available in government archives and also in the archives archives of the different government departments. So, so these are some of the key uh, events. So you can see that conservation, the, the World Heritage Site was declared uh, in 1999 to 2000. But conservation has existed in this area for a very long time. For example, in 1952, the area was declared a coastal forest reserve. And uh, in, in the 1980s, there were forced removals of local people from the reserve uh, for conservation. And, and in 1992, the conservation authorities introduced gill netting within the lakes. So the, the, there are a lot of narratives behind each of these points, which unfortunately I won't go into depth with. But if you would like to ask about some of them at the end, I'll be happy to take the questions. But so. In 1994, South Africa became a democracy. So because previously in the 1980s, people were forcibly removed from where they were. So in the three villages that I studied in Kosi Bay, two of these villages are still inside the World Heritage Site. One of the villages is now outside uh, the boundary of the World Heritage Site, even though they conduct their livelihood activities inside the World Heritage Site because in the night before the 1980s, they lived inside the World Heritage Site. So it was interesting to compare the, the two communities that are inside and the one that's now outside, but still conducting the livelihood uh, activities inside. But for the, for the village that's now outside the World Heritage Site, after 1994, the people from the village thought that they would probably be able to return inside and so on, but obviously that hasn't happened and I will speak more about that later on. But uh, in 1997, South Africa ratified the World Hatred Convention, which we, 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 when we ended up having the World Hatred Convention Act in 1999, and then the World Hatred Site was declared uh, in December 1999 and, and formally announced in 2000. So this is just a basic timeline that stipulates all these events. So when I tried to find out, before all these interventions that I've just put up uh, were, were introduced to the area, what were people doing in this area before all of this? Well, the local people stated that before all these governance interventions took over, agriculture was one of the most uh, important livelihoods in this area. So people used to be engaged in intensive crop farming of indigenous, within the indigenous forest inside what is now the World Heritage Site. They also had a lot of livestock, so they used to farm livestock. But unfortunately now it's almost completely uh, dwindled. They, there's not much livestock in the area. There was also a, a lot of marine resource harvesting. So a lot of the scientific research that has been published from Kosi Bay, especially in the 1980s and up until now, focuses a lot on fisheries, on the Kosi Bay fishery. But the other historical livelihoods, such as agriculture, have been completely ignored in the literature. And, 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 the, and, the, and the problem with that is that it makes it seem as if fisheries was the main livelihood in the area, when in fact, this wasn't true. 
according to the local people, agriculture was more important than fisheries because they used to use uh, the, the products from agriculture as, 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 as a staple for every meal during dinner. And fish was sometimes used as a protein uh, to supplement the, the starch. But the, the, the two livelihoods operated hand in hand. And it wasn't that fisheries has always been what people have been focusing on. So people also used to uh, engage in buttering of food, craft making, and the use of timber, non-timber forest products. So because the environment is so diverse, the, the, the biological diversity in this area is extremely high, people could be able to do all these things at the same time. Because there's usually a perception that uh, rural livelihoods are homogeneous and one-dimensional, but in coastal environments, rural livelihoods are extremely diverse. So one household can be involved in a series of activities in order to bring food on the table, and not just farming and not just fishing. So a lot of these activities in the past, before government uh, interventions took over, they, they, they were managed through customary rules. So these people have long-standing customary rules that they've used to manage uh, their activities, especially when it comes to fishing and agriculture. So these rules are managed by customary institutions that have been set up in the area. So, 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 uh, uh, so, so over the years, these institutions have evolved, but they still exist. And people use the customary rules to manage these uh, resources that are not necessarily the same as the rules that are imposed by conservation authorities. So after the, the governance interventions took over, the ones that I show in the timeline, people's livelihoods have shifted because of these different gov governance interventions. So for example, over the years, the, uh, the agricultural livelihood in the area has been demolished because when conservation strengthened uh, in the 1980s, people were prohibited from uh, continuing, continuing with agriculture within what is now the World Heritage Site. So what is now the World Heritage Site was fenced off since the 1980s and people didn't have access to it. And that was the land that was most fertile for the types of crops that the people in the area used to grow. And for the villages that are still inside the World Heritage Site, even though they live within the sites, they are not allowed to uh, plant crops in the areas near the lakes which are more fertile and where they used to previously conduct those livelihoods. So now there's also a heavy reliance on government grants to support livelihoods since uh, 1994. Marine resource harvesting is still continuing in the fish traps because the local people has managed to kick out, um, actually they refuse to work with SM Velocated and Wildlife, which is the uh, co which are the conservation authorities in the area because they felt that uh, as envelopated in wildlife was undermining their customary way of managing fishery res fisheries resources because they were introducing other ways of managing the fishery that the local people didn't agree with. So there are still conflicts there. And ecotourism has also been a livelihood that has been introduced in the area since uh, the late 1900s. So there was an anthropologist uh, called David Webster, some of you may have heard of him, who was assassinated, uh, I think, in the late 1900s. So he played a huge role in assisting some one of the villages in this area develop a tourism venture that has become a major a livelihood supporter of the people within this village, even in the present day. So like I mentioned that the, the agricultural livelihood was very important to these people, and it's been really difficult not being able to conduct this livelihood over the years. So what some of the women in the area have decided to do, because for them, agriculture is not just about putting food on the table. It's a livelihood. It's a, it's a way of living. For example, if, if, you, were, if you were a soccer player, it, sometimes it's not just about the money that you, you earn or the check that you earn at the end of the day. It's about the fact that you love playing soccer. That's what you love. That's what you do. If you're a musician, if someone had to take that away from you, you it, sometimes it's not about the money. You wouldn't be sad because you've lost 
money, but you will probably be more sad that someone is preventing you from doing something that is a part of who you are. And some of the women in this, areas are, are, in this area argue that agriculture is a part of who they are. And since conservation rules prohibits them to, con to, to, to perform this activity within their area, what they do is every day, so what you see here, this fence is the border between South Africa and Mozambique. So what these women do every day, they cross the border illegally from the Kosi Bay side to Mozambique to harvest their crops there. Because in Mozambique, the, 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 the environmental laws are very weakly enforced, and it's almost like free for all. And anyone can go there and ask for a piece of land from a local and pay them some money and plant their crops. So these women cross the border every day illegally. So when I asked this woman, you know, are they not afraid of being arrested? She said they'd been arrested many times and the, the, the border patrol officers even gave up arresting them because they realized that they wouldn't stop doing this. So, so this also raises a lot of questions when it comes to environmental sustainability because if this part of the border on my right is highly protected and there are high restrictions about what can happen, but as soon as you cross this mere fence, it, people can do whatever they want, then what, what does that mean for conservation? So we need to start thinking about those things. And the authorities are not yet thinking about these things, but it's a really important question because it compromises resource, resource sustainability. So when I interviewed one of the officials from Isimang Aliso Authority, which is the World Heritage Society Authority, he basically said that they are sitting with a challenge of pleasing UNESCO, which is the in international conservation body that is involved here, but at the same time benefit the local people. They feel like it's a huge paradox that they're struggling with resolving. However, according to the local people, the, some of the people feel that the way that conservation authorities understand conservation is different from how they understand conservation because a lot of the processes that have been used uh, to make decisions about the conservation uh, of the resources in these areas have, have not really included local people. So local people haven't really been involved in decision-making processes. And this is why you have this uh, gap in terms of what the authorities think about conservation and what the local people think. Because as it is now, the local people feel that conservation is there to oppress them, whereas the authorities say that it's there to preserve old heritage. But actually, the, the problem, the, 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 the huge issue with, uh, that, that results into this is the fact that the two never have the opportunity to sit in one table and talk things out. There are no platform in decision-making processes that allow for local people to participate, and this is why you end up with this problem. So this is a Venn diagram. So this is called a Venn diagram, where I was trying to understand the perceptions of people about power, make, uh, power and decision-making processes. And this is was conducted in one of the villages in the area where the local people felt that the people that are at the center of the decision-making nucleus is the World Heritage Authority together with the traditional authorities. And people felt that they are far removed from decision-making processes, that they said I must put them up on the tree because they feel like they don't count and they don't understand why and there's no accountability. So I'm not going to explain this because of time, so I'm just going to move on. So, so more recently, the World Heritage Authority has come up with a new strategy to, to manage the park. So this is part of the, of the requirements of UNESCO for World Heritage Sites. So every, so every five years, they have to come up with a, an integrated management plan. And in 2016, I attended a meeting where Isimangaliso Authority introduced their management plan for 2017 to 2021. And basically what they stated was that they want to rewild Isimangaliso World Heritage Site. So they want to rewild the park. It's not clear from that document what this means, what, how they define rewilding, but 
some of the narrative that's provided uh, in their websites is that within, a, within the year, Ismangali so intends to realize conservation, the conservation vision of restoring all historically occurring game back into the World Heritage Site. So their vision for, the, for 2017 to 2021 is to restore all the, all the, 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 the uh, plant and animal species that are historical to the area. So, so the, the problem with this is that the local people don't understand what this means for them. And I actually had the unique opportunity of attending one of the meetings that were, uh, that were put together by Isimangaliso Authority last year in June in order to introduce this plan. And one, one of the shocking things that I, I realized when I got there was the fact that although Isimangaliso Authority is, is sub, supposedly working with SM Velocated and Wildlife, who run the day-to-day -to -day, uh, day -day, uh, monitoring of conservation activities within the World Heritage Sites, and also the local municipalities, as well as the district's municipalities and traditional authorities. None of the other institutions were present at the meeting, which didn't make sense. So Ismail's authority would, I don't know if they were not invited or what was the issue, but they were not there. And also, the local people every, who were supposed to be at the meeting to give feedback about this plan were not properly invited to the meeting. So in fact, they, people were invited via email uh, through an electronic platform. And most people in this rural area don't even know what email is. They, they don't even understand English. And all these documents are also in English. So, this, so it was clear for me, because I had the opportunity to observe why these problems, problems exist. Because having a World Heritage Site is not a bad thing. And people understand that, OK, if the government wants to conserve resources, it's OK. But, but what people don't understand is why are we excluded? So I got the opportunity to observe uh, at first hand how people were excluded. So when one of the members of the audience asked, why are local people not present at this meeting? Then they said, oh, we just invited people that are mem that you have to sign in to be a member to get the email. It's a very complicated process, which obviously excludes local people. But that meeting ended up being a disaster because when local people found out that it was taking place, there was a huge protest outside where people actually boycotted the meeting, and it never proceeded after that. So, and, and, and the other issue that ar arose from that is that Isimang Aliso authorities, although on paper, according to the documents, they work together with Ezen Velokezed and Wildlife. And, and a lot of research that I've done previously, and I actually got to observe it that day as well, the relationship between the two institutions is not really good. They don't really uh, work well together because of power struggles. And a lot of these power struggles emanates from periods before 1994, which unfortunately I don't have time to go into. But this is something that was confirmed by one of the officials from Ezen Velokezede and Wildlife. But all of these power struggles between these two states' institutions have uh, implications on resource sustainability and on the livelihoods of local people. And basically, in response, the local people said that if they don't want to involve us in this decision-making process, it, 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 we don't understand what rewilding means. And basically, this is a quote that came from the community where people said that this is not a jungle or a wilderness. This is a place with people in it where we live. So somehow, someone needs to recognize us and include us and involve us in these decision-making processes. So, I'm not going to go into depth in this, but what, what basically these three slides show is that what I've tried to do is I've tried to use other types of methods in order to try and document the history of this area in order to understand how we can improve the, the, the issues that we have with governance that are seen now. So I've used uh, aerial photography, uh, ground photography, as well as other scientific uh, studies in order to, to complement some of the qualitative uh, knowledge that I've gathered from the study, but I don't have time to go into this. But the, the two last, thing that I, last things that I would like to highlight is that the, other issue, the, the key issues that persist in this area when it, it comes to governance are the ambiguous roles of statutory institutions. So like I've mentioned, the, the roles of 
is Mangalisa authority who are supposedly the world heritage authorities and as in Velokeze then wildlife who in other areas of KwaZulu Natal, they are the main conservation authorities. But within Ismangaliso, they work under Ismangaliso authority, but they are supposed to work together. But it turns out that they don't really work well together because of power dynamics. So this is a quote that was taken from an SM Velokeze and Wildlife uh, Authority who stated that there's still confusion among people about the difference between SM Velo and Ismangaliso. It makes people confused. I also don't understand how Ismangaliso and Ezem Velo work sometimes. It's difficult and complex to understand. When Ismangaliso authority was established, they instructed us not to communicate with community members, but we were the ones with some sort of relationship with the community members in the first place. So you can tell that there are definitely power dynamics that I play here, but nothing is happening when it comes to these, and no one is doing anything about this, but they are, they are actually inhibiting the governance process of the system, and they are affecting the system, the social part of the system, as well as the ecological side of the system. This is another quote, these two quotes. So this quote was taken from a member of the local municipality, and this one was taken from a private uh, tourism facility owner in Sotwana Bay. So the first one says that we have no control over Ismangaliso. There are so many things that they do that we have no control over, and that is a problem. Ismangaliso restricts a lot of our activities as they govern most of the land within the municipality. They don't involve us in decision making, and this is mostly because the law enables them, and there's nothing we can do. And this quote was taken from a so, so I think this guy used to grew up in Cape Town, and he he was able to start a lodge in Sotwana Bay, but a lot of the the private tourism facility owners in Sotwana Bay also shared the same sentiments with community members because what they were stating was that Isman Aliso is making it very difficult for them to run their businesses. So this guy was, oh, sorry. This guy stated that tourism is suffering because of World Heritage Sites rules. The number of tourists is declining because of this, and the worst thing is that Isman Aliso charges tourist fees to launch boats, and this hurts our business because it chases tourists away. So there were a lot of other issues that came, came up around this, but it was clear that there are a lot of issues that have to do with history, with politics, with power dynamics that are affecting how the World Heritage Site is being governed. And some of these issues are not common knowledge. They are not public knowledge. So my research has un un uncovered some of, some of these dynamics. The other last issue that came out was also the ambiguous role of traditional authorities. So this is another lecture altogether when we're talking about traditional authorities within rural areas in South Africa. Because during uh, the colonial and apartheid areas, traditional authorities were used as so, sort of as mechanisms to administer rural areas. So they were basically given discretionary powers. They were not as accountable to local people because they were given discretionary powers by the colonial and oppressive governments to do whatever they, they, they want, basically. So in 1994, when South Africa became a democracy, people thought that some of these powers that were not downwardly account where traditional authorities that traditional authorities use that enable them not to be downwardly accountable to wider rural communities. People thought that somehow they will be relinquished. However, after 1994, the governments in, in empowered traditional authorities. So now they have the same powers that they had in the past. And as a result of that, they are very powerful. They are not very accountable to other communities. So in the Kosi Bay area, what I found was that traditional authorities tended to be double dipping. So in the eyes of the community, they were their traditional leaders and they, they cared for their interests. But what I also found was that a member of the traditional authority was a chairperson of the district's municipality, uh, financial structure that was set up, and one of the key members of the traditional authority was a board member of Ismangaliso authority. So now when people were struggling with Ismangaliso authority because they were not consulting them, etc., they couldn't go to their leaders because their leaders were 
support, one of their key leaders was a board member in Ismangalis. So people then became confused. And what was even worse was that people had no knowledge of this. They didn't know that he was a member of, a board member of Ismangalis so until some issue came up in the community and it was published in a newspaper. So people found out from a newspaper that their own leader was actually a member of the World Heritage Authority Board. So you can see that there, there are all these problems. So you have problems with the state institutions, you have, there are power dynamics within the traditional institutions, and even the traditional authorities and state institutions, there are also a lot of power struggles there, which unfortunately I, I, I don't have time to go into. So I'm just gonna wrap up now. By, so, so, so some of the key lessons that come out of the research is that livelihood strategies are largely influenced by governance processes, especially when we're talking about rural areas. So understanding context is key, because while in some areas governance is not a key issue, in some areas it is a key issue, as we have seen here in Kosi Bay. So it's important to interrogate how global discourses and images and practices uh, that shape conservation are interpreted, are interpreted locally. Because a World Heritage Site is a very useful tool for managing world heritage globally. But if it's not interpreted correctly by using the right mechanism and the right institutions, it might lead to certain impediments that compromise the whole system, ecologically and socially. So we need to understand how these things are interpreted locally. Thirdly, institutional bricolage is needed. So that word basically means that institutions need to be re-looked, reconceptualized, and reworked over time. So one of the key issues is that a lot, in South Africa, when we established institutions, sometimes when there are problems with those institutions, we fail to go back and see why the problems exist and what we can do to fix them. So an institution may cause blockages, blockages here and there, but no one ever goes back to see how can we redesign this institution in order to solve these problems. So that needs to happen more within South Africa. And uh, it's also important to synergize historical indigenous knowledge with scientific evidence, evidence to improve governance. So if we want to improve governance, we can't just rely on natural science knowledge. We can't just rely on social science knowledge. We can't just rely on legal knowledge, but we need to have a holistic understanding of how systems work in order to understand some of the nuances that we cannot pick up if we just focus on one aspect of the environment. And lastly, understanding the role of history, politics, and power in shaping current governance processes that influence livelihoods is critical. Okay, thank you. So are there any questions? Okay, I'll take, we'll start there. Did the Timby Royal House ever receive a land claim? Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll just take like four and then I'll reply all of them. Okay, and there was one here. Um, we talked about 141,000 people yes. living in this area. Yes. They obviously live in urban settlements. How does that fit within your concept of this being an open rural area? Who's, who's living in urban? Yes. In, in the rural area. Yes. Do they live in a series of towns? No. It's all rural. There's only one small town that is Manguzi, but it's a bit further. It's like 30 kilometers away. But the villages are rural. There, there are no towns there. It's just rural. Strictly rural. In groups of so, so, so for example, the, the one village had about 150 homesteads. So people there don't have ho housing units as we see here. So one homestead can have eight dwelling units within one homestead. And in one of the villages, there were about 160 homesteads. In one of the villages, there was about 60 homesteads. And in the other one was 45 homesteads. So the, the numbers have declined a little bit over time because it's become very difficult for people to continue living in the area because of the rewilding that's taking place. So for example, the number of hippos within the lakes has increased with increasing conservation. And people state that in the past, the hippos were always there, but they were able to manage 
them to, to arrange their own spaces around the hippos. But it became difficult to do that because conservation authorities prevented them from interacting with the lakes. So whether it was conducting agricultural activities, especially in the lakes where the fish traps are not there. So as a result of that, wild animals are increasing and it's difficult for some of the people. For example, in one of the villages that I studied, for people to get to the nearest town where some kids have to go to school and some people have to go to work, they have to cross the lake, walk on the lake, basically. And at high tide, I actually one time I went on high tide and they had to swim over the lake every day, back and forth, because the conservation authorities say, well, we can't bring them a, a bridge because it's going to destroy the ecosystem. And at the same time, we can't give them a boat because it's going to encourage people from outside to come and live here. So now people are saying, but you know, what are we supposed to do? So there are a lot of issues around that. I hope that answers your question. It's just a lot of people. It's, it's not really, because these are indigenous people as well. These are not people that came out from any, these, these are people with a long history that predates the colonial era living in this area. So these are not people.